SpaceX tests its latest Starlink technology, two new rockets fly for the first time, and Blue Origin's new Glenn is finally at the pad. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 12th of January, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. Blue Origin has rolled out a New Glenn first stage booster to its launch pad at the Cape, and what's more, all of its components are now at the hangar. Now, a quick disclaimer for this, this rollout is 100% not for a launch. In fact, that may not happen until much later this year. But truth be told, this is quite an amazing sight as it confirms what we all thought. New Glenn is real and there's already a ton of hardware for it. Now, yesterday we released a much more detailed video about this roll and all the hardware that's coming down the line. However, since that video was published, we now have even more news from Blue Origin's new CEO, David Limp. The news came through a post that Limp had published on LinkedIn talking about this move, but the post also included a picture of the rocket's second stage inside of the horizontal integration facility at the launch pad. The stage has its pair of BE-3U engines attached and seems complete enough to perhaps be able to undergo cryogenic testing. The engines may not even be actual flight hardware either, as the mount that they're attached to says not for flight, but they could also be complete enough to at least be able to interface with the second stage systems. Right next to the second stage is also the transporter erector that will be used to stack the vehicle and roll it out to the launch pad once complete. And speaking of that, we've now seen the booster inside of the hangar, the second stage inside of the hangar, and last month we saw the rocket's fairing also inside of the hangar. These are all complete enough that perhaps Blue Origin could mate them all together and roll them out to the pad for the first time. As mentioned before, while both first and second stages are not configured for the flight, they appear to be complete enough to be able to receive cryogenic fluids. Cryogenic tests of the full rocket on the pad would allow Blue's teams to test the ground systems with an actual vehicle on it, and it would also allow them to test the stages while joined together. All in all, this bodes well for a potential launch of New Glenn towards the end of the year, and we sure hope to see a lot more progress in the future. We'll be keeping an eye on you, Blue Origin. And now let's take a look at this week in launches. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a Kuaizhou 1A from China. Liftoff took place on January 5th at 1120 UTC from Site 95A at the Zhou Chen Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying another trio of Tianmu-1 satellites into a sun-synchronous orbit. This is the third trio of Tianmu-1 weather observation satellites launched by the Kuaizhou 1A rocket in two weeks. A Falcon 9 rocket lifted off on January 7th at 2235 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. It was carrying a batch of 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage, B1067, was flying for a 16th time and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship A Shortfall of Gravitas. With this launch, SpaceX has now launched a total of 5,694 satellites, of which 383 have re-entered and 4,600 have moved into their operational orbit. Just a few hours later, we finally saw the debut of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket, but its main payload will sadly not complete its mission. Liftoff took place on January 8th at 7.18 UTC from Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. This first flight of Vulcan did not carry any mass simulators, but rather an actual payload, two in fact. The rocket was carrying Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander as its main payload, and as a rideshare, Centaur had attached to it the Celestis Memorial Spaceflight's Deep Space Voyager mission. The liftoff and initial ascent went successfully with the Gem 63 XL solid rocket motors performing as expected and being jettisoned on time. Blue Origin's two BE-4 engines on Vulcan's booster successfully fired for the completion of the nearly five minute long boost phase, something that bodes very well for the company's new Glenn rocket. Our photographers in Florida were able to capture the awesome blue flame of these engines and the fury of the Gem 63 XL motors as Vulcan lifted off. This included the funny smiley face that the mock diamonds from the BE-4s formed during liftoff. And on this streak shot from Sawyer, you can see how the color of the plume goes from the bright white of the solid motors to blue once those were jettisoned. Vulcan's boost phase put the Centaur 5 and its payloads into space and at well over half the speed needed to reach orbit. Centaur then successfully conducted a 10-minute burn of its two RL-10 engines to insert itself into a parking orbit. This was followed half an hour later with a 4-minute burn to send the Peregrine Lunar Lander into a highly elliptical orbit around Earth. 
Centaur then performed another burn afterward that put it and the Celestis Memorial in a heliocentric orbit. Astrobotics Peregrine Lander successfully separated from the Centaur, but after that, an anomaly occurred, so the lander will not be able to land on the moon. The company quickly shared the news on social media, where it has since been openly talking about the progress of the mission over the past few days. Thanks to this transparency, we now know what may have happened with Peregrine up to this point. Shortly after separation, teams initialized the lander's propulsion system, essentially turning on systems and cycling valves to make sure that all worked. According to the company's hypothesis, it was at this point that a valve between the helium pressure system and the oxidizer tank failed to reseal after it had been activated. This led to a rise in pressure on the oxidizer tank beyond its structural limits, and it was ruptured. This rupture led to a leak of propellant from the lander that caused it to lose nominal attitude control, and it was unable to properly point towards the sun for battery recharge. Thankfully, astrobotic teams were capable of quickly solving this attitude issue and regained control of the spacecraft and recharged the batteries. However, due to the leak, the company says that the attitude control thrusters are being used more than planned, and Peregrine will likely run out of propellant soon. As of the latest update, Astrobotic now expects this propellant to run out by Saturday, but the leak rate has slowed down recently, so the company may be able to squeeze just a bit more time out of the propulsion system. In the meantime, the company is working hard to gather as much data as possible from operating the lander and has successfully received data from all nine payloads designed to communicate with it. In a nominal case, Peregrine's trajectory would have seen the lander go at least once around the Earth before encountering the Moon. However, with this issue, the trajectory may have changed as a result of the leak. So this could mean that, while it won't be able to land on the Moon, it may still reach its surface with what we call a litho-breaking. With Vulcan's first successful flight now done, a second flight is expected to come later this year when it flies the Dream Chaser spacecraft to the ISS. After that, the rocket will be able to be certified to carry military payloads and carry them out. This week, we also had the launch of a Changzheng 2C carrying the Einstein probe into low Earth orbit. Liftoff took place on January 9th at 7.03 UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in China. The Einstein probe is a wide-field X-ray observatory built by the Chinese Academy of Sciences in collaboration with the European Space Agency, who's contributing part of an instrument for the probe, as well as ground station and science data support. Its lobster eye optic system will enable this observatory to have an unprecedented field of view of 3,600 square degrees, the greatest of any X-ray observatory. Another Kwajo 1A launch took place on January 11th at 3.52 UTC from Site 95A at the Zhouchen Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying the second Tianxing-1 satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. Not much is known about the Tianxing-1 satellite so far, other than that they're supposed to conduct measurements of the space environment. This week we had another rocket debut, with Orion Space's Gravity-1 rocket flying for its first time. Liftoff took place on January 11th at 5.30 UTC from the Dongfang Hong Tiangong Barge, located a few kilometers off the coast of China. The rocket was carrying three Yunyao-1 Earth observation satellites into low Earth orbit. Gravity-1 is an all-solid propellant rocket, and it's the largest all-solid propellant rocket launched so far. It features four boosters as its first stage, and a vacuum-optimized version of these makes up the central solid rocket motor that is counted as its second stage. The rocket's third stage is a shortened version of that motor, and on top of that resides a fourth stage, also using solid propellant that's in charge of inserting the satellites into the required orbit. This final stage also contains a set of attitude control thrusters that allow the stage to control its attitude at all times, do fine adjustments of the final orbit, and also lower the upper stage's perigree so it re-enters within days of the launch. This rocket has only been in development for three years, expedited by the ability to make use of already existing solid rocket motor technology. Orion Space already plans to develop a second gravity rocket, Gravity 2, which will be partially reusable and feature liquid-fueled engines. And from China to Japan, we also had the launch of an H-2A rocket. Liftoff took place on January 12th at 4.44 UTC from Launch Pad 1 at the Tanegashima Space Center. The rocket was carrying the IGS Optical 8 satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. The IGS Optical 8 satellite is the 10th optical satellite in Japan's Intelligence Gathering Satellite Reconnaissance Program. This program uses radar and optical satellites in low Earth orbit for intelligence gathering purposes on multiple different frequencies. 
SpaceX has tested its Starlink satellites with the capability to transmit directly to cell phones. If you remember from last week's episode, the satellites were launched back on January 3rd, and it only took five days for the company to test this capability. Satellite to cell phone connectivity is quite a challenge compared to using ground antennas. On one hand, the satellites are located hundreds of kilometers away from the cell phones, and they need to be able to receive and transmit the signals. And as you probably know, cell phones don't typically have a giant antenna with lots of power on it, so instead these satellites need to be equipped with that big antenna so that they can receive weak cell phone signals and then transmit high power signals for the phone to pick up. On the other hand, these satellites are also moving at orbital speeds, which introduces a Doppler effect on the frequencies being sent back and forth, so they need to be able to account for that too. SpaceX posted a picture on social media of the text message exchange between two test phones using this direct-to-cell capability. As you can see from the picture, it looks like some of these messages weren't sent properly, probably as a result of a dropout in the system. With this data in hand, though, the company will be able to tweak either the design or the deployment of subsequent satellites to make it more reliable before rolling out this service to customers. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. NASA has announced that the United Arab Emirates will be developing an airlock to be installed at the upcoming Lunar Gateway Station. The announcement comes after more than a year of negotiations between the agency and the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center to supply an airlock for this lunar station. In its original inception, this airlock was supposed to be developed by Roscosmos, but the agency pulled out of the program shortly after, forcing NASA to find a new partner. As part of this partnership, NASA will fly a UAE astronaut to Gateway in a future Artemis mission. NASA has finally been able to open the sample canister for OSIRIS-REx. If you remember, after the retrieval of the OSIRIS-REx return capsule, teams were able to get asteroid samples that had overflowed outside of the sample canister. However, the bolts that fastened the canister were unable to be removed with the tools that were in use inside of its glove box. It would seem that solving this issue would be pretty simple, but actually being able to develop a method to remove these bolts without introducing any contamination sources is very complicated. Complicated. It's even more complicated when the sample canister is inside of a tightly confined space like the glove box that it's currently in. Well, thankfully, teams were able to design, test, and validate the appropriate tools to release these bolts and will next work on removing the samples from the canister. We definitely can't wait to see what they discover from studying these. China's next lunar mission, Chang'e 6, is now at its launch site and being processed ahead of launch. This latest lunar lander mission will be the first lunar sample return mission to return samples from the far side of the moon. Launch of this mission is currently set to occur in May of this year, and it's set to land in the southern part of the Apollo Basin. This location is believed to contain material from the moon's mantle that was excavated during asteroid impacts several billion years ago. Up next should be the transport of the Chang'e 5 rocket that will carry it all the way to the moon. And speaking of rocket transports, we've had a few of those lately, haven't we? Roscosmos has finally transported the first Angara rocket set to launch from Vistachny. After decades of development of the Angara rocket and only a handful of flights under its belt, this rocket will soon debut from a new launch pad. This will allow it to fully replace the Proton rocket as intended when its development began 32 years ago. This week, Firefly Aerospace showed off progress in the development of its upcoming medium launch vehicle, also known as MLV. The company shared a couple of pictures on social media of a test piece from a carbon fiber cylinder produced by its new auto fiber placement machine. The company's new MLV rocket will be much larger than its current Alpha rocket, which was already the largest all-composite rocket ever created. Creating big cryogenic tanks out of composites is a big challenge, so this is a great step in the development of the rocket. The company also teased us to stay tuned for more, so you can bet that we'll be keeping an eye on it. And now, let's take a look at what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off later today, we'll have the launch of a batch of Starlink satellites from Vandenberg. Liftoff is set to occur on January 13th at 8.59 UTC. A Falcon 9 is set to launch next week, carrying a batch of Starlink satellites into orbit from Florida. The four and a half hour launch window is set to open on January 14th at 52 minutes past midnight UTC. This week we'll also have a launch of a Changzhang 7 rocket with the Tianzhou 7 cargo spacecraft heading to the Tiangong space station. Liftoff is scheduled to occur within a 3 hour launch window that opens on January 15th at 1300 UTC. The spacecraft will then take about 6 hours to dock with the station's aft docking port. 
Another Falcon 9 is set to launch SpaceX's next crew mission, Axiom 3, to the International Space Station. Liftoff of Falcon 9 with Crew Dragon Freedom is set to occur on January 17th at 2211 UTC. Freedom is then scheduled to dock to the front docking port of the ISS Harmony module on January 19th at 1015 UTC. Rocket Lab's first launch of 2024 is set to occur next week with the launch of Four of a Kind from New Zealand. Electron's liftoff is set to occur within a 30-minute launch window that opens on January 18th at 6.22 UTC. We'll then have another Falcon 9 lifting off from Vandenberg with another batch of Starlink satellites. The four and a half hour window is set to open on January 19th at 2.22 UTC. And mark your calendars because next week we'll have a lunar landing! JAXA's slim lunar lander is now in orbit around the moon and is expected to perform a lunar landing attempt on January 19th at 1520 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.